when we were planning this conference, they said, what did you have in mind for a theme? I said, well, I have a silly one, I have a serious one. I said, what's the serious one? I said, meet me at the Sea of Galilee. Peter denied Jesus three times, and I mean he denied him. He said, I don't even know the man. Jesus restored him three times and ended it with, follow me. So he, he restored him to the full apostleship. And that one would have been on restoring the things that we've lost. And the other one was, I was on a really, really tired day, and I saw this picture of this flamingo, and through my head went, when you have only one leg left to stand on, stand. With the flamingo theme, and that's the, they wanted the fun one, so that's why we wound up with this theme. Um, Walking through life can be complicated. And sometimes we don't know what stand means. The verb portion of stand is to rise and maintain an upright position on the feet, which everybody knows, you stand up. It also can mean to stand under circumstances, stand to the right, stand to the left, stand behind. Stand fast is another phrase that's used a lot in the Bible. It's a noun. It's a firm, fixed, or settled position. I'm not moving. That one sounds like me. We need to stand to battle ready. Uh, it calls attention to you and speaks of resolve. Picture a gate guard at a military base. They stand their entire shift. I mean, perfect stance. They don't move. I'd fall on my face personally, but they stand the whole entire time. A friend's husband did a sermon here at our church one day, and he talked about how we need to walk with God taking our training seriously. And in the sermon, he talked about we were allies with Russia for a short time, and one day a whole entire motorcade of Russians came in the game. And he said, I knew they were supposed to be our allies. Nobody here was comfortable that they were coming in the gate. And he said, I stood there, and... I was checking off every vehicle. He said, I could, I, could, uh, I could look at this vehicle and go, I know exactly how to stop that one in its tracks. I know what to stop this, what to do to stop that one in its tracks. He was very quickly checking off everything in his head, everything he had to do in case this turned bad. And he was getting his head cleared out so that he could concentrate. It was peaceful visit after all, but he still pulled all of his training and everything he knew. Had it not been peaceful, all of that training would have come in help, helpful because they wouldn't have gotten away with much. Sometimes when we go through life, we're going, I know that I had a health journey not too, too long ago, and I asked God one day, I know I'm supposed to stand. What does that mean? There are a lot of scriptures about standing in the Bible. When we're overwhelmed with life, though, it can be hard to figure out how to stand. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, and be strong. When my daughter was born, the doctor told me she was too fragile to hold that I could not pick her up. And what she, the end that she would die. I stood outside the window of the nursery and I prayed. I was also overwhelmed with sadness. Even when she was released from the uh, neonatal ICU, he didn't tell me any different. When she came home, she was four pounds and wearing a doll's dress. I would stand at the foot of her bed and ask God if he would let her live. I didn't find out for two years later when another doctor looked at the records and he said, no, she was out of danger when she got out of the ICU at day 16. Now I need to stand in forgiveness because I'm really mad at a doctor, okay? That was a hard time in my life and I cried so many quiet, soft prayers to my precious Holy Father. I am blessed that he helped build my faith during that time. It made me a stronger Christian and it made me into a prayer warrior for other people's needs. So I ask him, what does it take to get to the place where you can stand? Second Thessalonians 2.15 said, Therefore, brethren, stand fast, 
and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. They're saying that what you've been taught, that you need to do that. That's how you stand. They were walking with Jesus. They learned everything from Jesus. So you can't get a better source or a closer source than that. He was calling the people to a real relationship. The traditions he mentioned are the ways we serve God and the ways we believe to be truth. I would not let a person who is not Bible-based teach my daughter anything. Whether it's a teacher, preacher, friend, or YouTube guru, you have to guard your heart by making sure the teachings you receive are from God. Look up the scriptures they're reading. If they're quoting it wrong, that's not from God. And drawing near to God in relationship is more than just I want and I need. Tell him you're grateful for his blessings. Tell him how wonderful you think he is. He's worthy of your praise. Growing in God is a challenging journey, but it can also be a really fruitful and fun one. 2 Corinthians 1.24 says, Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy. For by faith you stand. The writer clarifies it's not their dominion over your faith. For by faith you stand. You have to guard your own selves. You have to choose faith. I had a long battle from November last year, and it's it's still at the present time, but I'm so much better. And I thought at first it was a spiritual attack. But the longer it went on, and the more weak I felt, and the more tired I got, I decided it was me. So I started going into the thing where I'm not worthy, okay? And then by the time a couple of months ago happened, I realized it was a spiritual attack and it was the strongest spiritual attack I've ever had on my life. It lasted for months. There was a non-stop barrage of negative thoughts and fear. So I had to choose faith. I had to choose to trust God. I had to choose that whatever His will was, I was willing to do that. Because I spent a lot of time being afraid that I would not make it through this, and therefore the person I'm guardian of would not have somebody to take care of her. I have a friend at the coast whose father-in-law was diagnosed with cancer. He laid down on the couch the day they told him that. And he lay there for two or three years until he died with that cancer. And she said, my husband and I have decided that we are going to live until we die. When I came home from the coast that day, I determined I'm going to live till I die. I'm going to be alive. I'm going to enjoy my life. I'm going to choose faith. I'm going to choose God. I'm going to choose trust. And I'm going to live until I die. In 2 Corinthians 1.24 that we just read, they said that they do not have dominion over your faith. It means that they don't hold the faith for you. You have to hold it yourself. When I went through this journey, I spent a lot of time calling friends. And when I got to the point where I thought, okay, they're going to go, Ugh, it's hard when I call, I started calling prayer lines. <laughs> so... But the, and I didn't put much stock in prayer lines, but uh, Vicki's husband used to work at one, and he would tell me how awesome it was and how hard they would pray. And all of the people that prayed for me on the prayer lines, and I might call five of them at night, okay? Uh, all of those people prayed the most wonderful prayers. And they helped my faith to rise up. And they didn't ask for little things. They asked God to heal my heart. They asked God to give me strength. They asked God to give me courage. Everything the Bible says to do that I seem to have forgotten how to do. But I became a crybaby to my friends. <laughs> then I became a crybaby cry baby to the prayer lines, but they didn't seem to mind. And then I started pulling out of it. So one of the things I learned in this journey is don't make it harder than it really is. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again by the yoke of bondage.
We can complicate things really easily. Y'all might not, but I can. Remember when you were first saved, you probably felt a freedom, a joy, and a relief. Don't put yourself under bondage again. Have faith that God is still the God you sought. He's still the God who gave you salvation. And it's really easy. Loving Him is simple. Remembering who He is is simple. Being thankful for what He's done is simple. Reading His Word is simple, especially since it's available in every format out there. Audiobooks, Bibles, uh, apps on your phone. I had a friend calling me crying because she was having a really hard day. She had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She had been talking in tongues every time she prayed for three days. And then she woke up, and it was gone. And she called me crying and said, it's gone. And I laughed softly, and I went, it's not gone. Just start praising God, and it'll be back. The next day, I get a phone call, and it's a tearful, thank you. So, uh, sometimes I think humans, sometimes I think humans love complication. But the truth is, we fear it to the point that we bring it on ourselves. Fear is the opposite of faith. And if you're going to stand in faith, sometimes the only way you can stand in faith is to actually praise God and get in His presence. And if you're trying to get out of a problem you're having, if life is stomping you into the ground, then you have to figure out what's holding you back. And if it's broken, fix it. If you fall into the same trap of sin over and over and over, turn from that thing that has you tied in knots and talk to God about it. If you meant it and you turned from that sin and you sought Him, the problem is solved. You're now clean and free again. And when Satan speaks his lies, you read in that scripture, it says God forgave that sin and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. So not only am I better guy, I am. We have to put on the whole armor of God, which is what Vicki's going to talk about. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's the power against spiritual forces of evil. These aren't physical weapons. These are spiritual weapons. They are divine weapons made for the warfare that we have to do out there. They have divine power to destroy strongholds. My son once asked me, should we be afraid of demons? And I told him, how's your walk with God? He, he said, what? I said, okay, you against the demon, you're toast. The demon against God, he's toast. So you need to make sure you're right with God and God will protect you from the demon. And I said, no, I don't fear the demon. When Elijah asked God to open the eyes of his servant, it was to show the servant that God was right there. Their protection was an army of angels in flaming chariots of fire. God was ready to do the fighting for them, even though, from what the servant could see, there was nothing that they could do because the army was so big that was coming against them. But the armor of God is the belt of truth. It's the word of God that divides lies from truth like a surgeon's knife. The breastplate of, right, breastplate of righteousness is where we stand in our relationship with God. Feet fitted and ready to share the gospel is, are you ready to get up and do what God asks you to do? The shield of faith is whether you believe and are assured in the God who keeps you safe. The helmet of salvation is to accept Jesus as God's Son and the work He did for us at the cross. The sword of the Spirit is God's Word. And the answer to most of the problems we have is right here in that book. We have to dress for what we want. If we were part of a sniper brigade, we wouldn't go in in gym shorts, okay? We would go in with uh, armor-proof vests and you name it. We know that Satan is on the prowl, and it's said he's walking around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
That doesn't mean he's going to come harass you a little bit. That means he's going to try to destroy you. So that's why we need the armor of God. And God said put on the full armor of God. You don't garden in a prom dress. Or well, not for your own. You don't play in the snow with warm clothes on. We dress for what we face in real life. We need to dress what we face in spiritual life. Psalm 35.2, take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. That's God talking. A shield is clenched with your fist. Some shields are big enough that you can hide behind them. They cover your whole body. A buckler is a small shield that you wear on your arm and you can deflect the blows that they give you. One source even said, or you could just hit them with it. God says, stand up for my help. He wants participation. participation. He wants you to let him be God. So, I thought it was awesome that he said, you get the shield, you get the buckler, stand up, and I'll help. What do we stand in? What are the things that we have to have in order to stand? One of them is grace and hope. Romans 5.2 says, though through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I had his, my husband had his pickup stolen in San Antonio many years ago. He called me in a complete panic because he had thousands of dollars worth of tools. He was known as the tool man on the job sites. If you need an unusual tool or if you need um, a particular tool that only fits like one thing, you call him. He has it. When they found his truck, it was swept clean of all the tools. They even took the nail screws and sawdust out. Their sole purpose was to take the tools. I started to worry about how he was going to finish the jobs he was already doing, and God said had hope in me. I didn't even know the concept of standing in hope at that time. But I quit worrying and people started bringing tools. By the time they stopped, he had all the basic tools. And some people would come to him and say, I don't know anything about tools. What do you need money and what do you need? And sometimes they would buy the specialty tool for him and sometimes they would give him money. So by the time the whole entire thing was over, he was the tool man again. Amen. What do we stand in? Forgiveness, like a while ago when I said, the doctor who made me pray, can she please live for two years? Whenever you stand praying, when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. We have to forgive to be forgiven. And sometimes that sounds unfair when we're really upset with the people. But it's not, because for unforgiveness does not hurt them at all, but it destroy, destroys you from the inside out. One other thing we stand in is the gospel or the word of God. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand. We stand in the word of God. Jesus made many, many references to this. If we keep his words and hide them in our hearts. He even shut Satan down with the, by quoting the Bible. Mm -hmm. Satan was also quoting the Bible to him. He was quoting it wrong. The importance and power of God's word in the life of those who love, honor, and obey is the whole theme of Psalms 119. How do we hide God's word in our heart? In Hebrew, it means to treasure, to regard as highly valued, to hide, keep, save up, or store. There could be a time coming to America when they will take away the paper Bibles and they'll monitor your phones to see if you have a Bible app. That is a possibility for the future. This is not a doomsday sermon. <laughs> there is nothing, there is nothing to fear if you have the word of God hidden in your heart. Okay. And I'm not one of the ones who can um, memorize scriptures and quote off the references Becca's great at that. That can memorize scriptures and quote off the references. But when I need them, the scriptures come to my mind enough that I can just quickly look it up on the internet and quote the people the real whole scripture. Unity is another thing we stand in because we stand 
better and stronger when we do it together. Philippians 1.27 says, Only let your conversation be as it becomes to the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. The biblical definition of unity is one mind and one spirit. Unity does not mean we're clones of each other. It means we work well together, love each other, think like each other, usually because we're following the same precepts out of the Bible. It allows our friends to voice their opinions and beliefs. If they're far out there wrong, we lovingly show them in God's word that they're wrong. Unity is the opposite of rivalry, competition, fighting, discord, and separation. What do we stand in? The will of God. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's something we can pray for each other. The will of God causes anxiety in a lot of people. Where do we find it? The word? If it will pull you away from God, it's not his perfect will. If you have peace and doors open, it might be his perfect will. But if we keep his precepts and obey his commands, we will find his will. Don't be afraid. Just trust him. What do we stand in? Knowing who we are, our identity, our defense, what God has done for us, faith and peace instead of fear. Remember, there are many scriptures saying God fights for us. Ephesians 3.10 says that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Deuteronomy 3.22 You shall not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. Exodus 14.14 14, The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to be silent. So in one place he tells you to stand so he can fight for you. In another place he said you don't have to do anything, just stand up and be quiet. Another thing we stand in is identity. I don't like the term, life happens. It makes it sound like life is calling the shots, but it's not. God is our very present help in the time of trouble. He's our defender, he's our counselor, he's our healer, he's our savior, he's our provider, he's our father, and so much more. We need to remember who we belong to. I am a child of the great I am. Then we will have balance. There will never be a perfect day perfect spouse, a perfect child, a perfect anything else that dwells here on earth. We juggle all the elements of our lives trying to trying for something perfect. You're not going to find it. My favorite stand for God is related to the song we just sang, I Stand in Awe of You. When they sang that song a couple of weeks ago, I was like, oh, Father, that is the best stand yet. It's like my heart talking out loud. I've often said that I don't think many Americans understand what holy is, or what praise really looks like, or how huge and powerful God really is. If you're having a struggle, and the struggle is winning, remember who you are, who you are and who you belong to. Stand battle ready, have faith in God, improve your relationship with God. You have to choose faith that doesn't happen by accident. Don't make it hard. If it's broken, fix it. Repent. Ask for help. Wear battle gear, protection, and divine power in the weapons. Gear up with the right armor.